Welcome to the Radiant Visalia podcast. Join us at one of our two services, 9 a.m. and 1045 a.m. Download the Church Center app or visit our website, radiantvisalia.com, to stay connected with us. All right, enjoy. Good morning, everybody. We are Rudy and Debbie Witchy. And this morning, we are leading you through the Advent sharing. And uh, this is the second week of Advent. And today, we will light the Bethlehem candle. The term Advent means arrival. It refers to both Jesus' first and second coming. The first being Christmas that we celebrate, and the second, of course, is yet to come. Over the years, Advent has become our church's, church family's way to slow down a little bit, make room for Jesus in our hearts and also in our homes as we approach Christmas. Our Bible reading this morning is from Luke 2, 1 through 7. Now it came about in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all were proceeding to register for the census, everyone to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. And it came about that while they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the end. The Bethlehem candle is about peace. It reminds us that Jesus came to make his home with us and bring us peace, and that he has promised to never leave us alone. So when we think about peace, different things can come to mind. Is it peace in a family? Is it peace amongst countries? For me, when I think about peace, there's that too, but there's also um, a couple of experiences that stand out, and one in particular that I'm going to share a little bit this morning. As some of you know, uh, Debbie and I were privileged to serve with uh, Wycliffe Bible Translators in Indonesia some years ago, and we were out in a village, uh, fairly remote. Malaria is still uh, all around there. Uh, One day, we already had our oldest son, Nate. He was born there. And um, one day, we were, we had a a malaria attack (laughs) both at the same time, which hardly ever happened. Usually it's one or the other, but we were both sick in in bed, not feeling good, uh, get these massive headaches, the chills and the fevers and all that stuff that goes with it. But um, since we were both in bed, the people that I worked with, the indigenous people, the men noticed that I was missing. So <clears throat> about halfway through the day, they came, four men came to our little uh, shelter there, basically, to our cabin. And um, they sat around our bed. So here we are in bed with the mosquito net around us <laughs> and kind of like a tent that you can see through. And um, the men came. One was the pastor and uh, three other men that I knew quite well. And uh, they sat around, which is their tradition. They don't sit on chairs, they sit on the floor. And um, basically they started praying for us in their native language, which we didn't understand that well. But um, I remember the intense feeling, or feeling is maybe not the right term, but 
a sense of literally being lifted and um, that the worry of, of uh, worrying about Nate, is he going to get sick, about my wife, about work, of course, i got to get this stuff done. And uh, Anyway, I, I, I do clearly remember uh, that intense sense of being lifted up and uh, uh, not all the worries were gone, but, but a lot of them. And I remember thinking, and it's going to give me the chills as I think about it again, so this is the peace of God. This is, this is what it means to be peaceful and not have this inner struggle so much. And uh, that's uh, definitely one experience that stands out for me as I think back. And that's been, that's been a, a few years, so, but uh, I, will, I will never forget that. So um, that the, uh, the people that we came to minister to, basically, uh, yeah, they ministered to us in a very powerful way. And um, um, yeah, they took care of us and how powerful that was to, to have uh, them pray for us. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I was just going to share a little experience too. So after we came back to the States, we um, settled here in Visalia. I had three kids. And um, when I think of peace, I looked it up and it's like um, some of the words were, I mean, it was sounded so good, like quiet, freedom from disturbance, mental calm, serenity. How many of you can say that about your households? I know, when raising three kids, it was, and I have to say, two of the boys love to wrestle constantly. So there was not too much peace, I felt like, in our home. But um, I remember one time, um, as they grew up and um, in college, I had a recurring bad dream that just would not leave me, and I would just be filled with fear. I was like, is this really going to happen? you know, this dream. And uh, it just gripped me for quite a while. And I just couldn't shake it. And I remember just, you know, praying with all my heart to like, um, is this going to happen? Or just, just so fearful. And finally, I don't know, it took a while. I don't know how long I can remember, but it was a while. Finally, I remember sleeping through the night. And that fear was, was gone. It was lifted. And you know what? That dream, that bad dream never happened. So I know it wasn't, it was, you know, it's from the enemy. And, um, and so I just really feel like peace to me is, it really starts in the mind. You know, it's a battle. And um, I really thought of, of the verse too that um, Isaiah 26, 3, God keeps in perfect peace those whose mind is stayed on him because they trust in him. And I just feel like, um, you know, this is a promise from our Prince of Peace. He works to bring um, wholeness and well-being and to set our minds free. His government and its peace will never end. Isn't that just like an amazing promise? Um, I want to just say a prayer, and this prayer is a blessing, and it comes from um, 1 Thessalonians, or actually 2 Thessalonians. And if you want to, just, just raise your hands and receive this, um, to receive this peace that, that God promises to all of us. It says, um, Now may the Lord himself, the Lord of peace, pour into you his peace in every circumstance, and in every possible way, may the Lord's tangible presence be with you all. Amen. As we light, sorry, <laughs> as we light the Bethlehem candle. Will you join us and repeat what's on the screen? <laughs> Would you repeat with me? Ready? Jesus Christ is the light of the world. 
the light no darkness can overcome. Yes. Amen. Ryan Turner, would you come? Yeah. Yeah. If you've been a part of Radiant for some time, you know that we're committed to planting churches. And there's a cost to that, as many of you have had to say goodbye to uh, good friends. Um, But there's also so much we receive in sending. And one of the things that makes this all worth it is getting to see new leaders develop. That with the space and with the new place, we see people's gifts emerge. And Ryan is certainly uh, one of those. And he'll, he'll bring you into a little bit of what he's uh, been up to. But we're so, side, so excited to welcome him. I think we can often think as a, as a parent church that we're giving or sacrificing so much. And I just want you to know that we receive uh, so much in getting to send. It's not something we have to do. It's something we, we get to do. We get to release um, and see things grow and flourish uh, because of that. So would you join me in just praying and, and blessing uh, Ryan and the work God's doing in his life? Thank you, Father, for your hand in this man's life. We just continue to ask that you would activate the gifts inside of him to bless to Larry, and to bring you glory. And everyone said, amen. amen. Well, good morning. It is a, a real joy and honor to be here today. Uh, we are family. Uh, you invited Cousin Eddie from Tulare to come speak today. <laughs> I got the trailer out front. So <laughs> um, I, I get to bring greetings and blessings actually from Tulare, um, from your family over there. And um, this morning I was thinking about, I was like, oh man, this is like how Paul started or ended some of his letters was like, hey, greetings from your family over in this other place. Um, and so I just want to tell you that, that we're doing well in Tulare. And that God is doing amazing things in Radiant Tulare and in the community of Tulare. And I also just want to say thank you. Thanks for sending us. Thanks for supporting us. And thanks for sharing the Gap Your Kids and Danny with us. And thanks for sending us Mark and Kathleen. Uh, All of that has just bolstered our family that's there, the branch that's there, and um, the community that's benefiting because of it. Um, So this is like real tangible, like churches planted and lost or being found and and prodigals are coming home in Tulare like they are here. So so it's a good report from Tulare. We're really, really thankful. I've been a part of Radiant. uh, My mental math's not great, so um, it's a good thing there's a countdown back there. Um, But we were meeting at Rotary Theater. So what is that, like 12, 13 years ago? I don't know, something like that. Um, I grew up in Tulare, and then my parents moved away to pastor a church in Phoenix. They pastored in Tulare for like 22 years. Um, And so when they moved, we moved on as well. Actually, my first uh, visit to Radiant by Cell, you were meeting at, I don't know, another different numbered street, maybe first or something like that. Um, it was like a little building in a little room. And we, were, we had gone with a small group of friends to like find another church family to worship with. And um, the plan was to go out after lunch, talk about it, whatever. And Jared said, I think I'm going to stay. And I said, I think I'm going to keep looking. There was something... The way that God's put, that that wasn't, yeah, that sounded worse than it was. It was, um, that's not what I meant. That's not what I meant. (laughs) Obviously, I'm still here, so it's it's all right. Um, There's like, the way that God's put me together and what the Enneagram would label six is this like diligence in me to like do something responsible. You know, I, I can't. I try to fight against it and it doesn't work. So, um, and so I just felt like there was some kind of diligent responsibility. I needed to go like 
make sure like I wasn't just going somewhere because someone else was, you know? So did that. And I remember, um, Jared and I had breakfast one morning in, in Tulare Nielsen's, which doesn't exist anymore. Um, but I mean, the building does. So if anybody wants to get it and revive it, we'd love it. Um, but it was a cool little diner, but he was asking like, Hey, how's that going? And I said, it's all right. You know, like it's not great. No, <laughs> um, there, I, you know, it was, it was good people and, and good families of, of the church kind of gathering around and good teaching. But I said, I just want to be with people that I know and people that know me. And he said, well, I know a place. I said, I know I'm going to come tomorrow. And that was, they were, that was rotary. And, um, and that's, and that uh, here's where I've been. And, um, and then we got the opportunity to, to be sent to Tulare, though I, I was living in Tulare. So I was still there, but anyway, you know, like, you know what I mean? Um, this church family, um, has nurtured me and it has challenged me and it has really grown me up actually. Um, I have been, and I continue to be, um, mentored and invested in by men and women in this church, people that I look to as like big brothers and sisters, um, and like parental figures, uh, Man, and the family of God, specifically here at Radiant, this part is good. So it's good to be with you today and get to share. Um, the first time that I didn't spend Thanksgiving with my parents was a couple of years ago. Um, and I don't know if you've had this experience where you, like the first time you didn't get to be home for a holiday, um, probably specifically Thanksgiving or Christmas. I don't think people care about being home on Columbus Day. Um, but um, initially it kind of seemed like, yeah, it's no big deal. It is what it is. Circumstances were what they were. We were going to go, or they were going to come out for Christmas, my folks were. And um, so it was kind of in my head, like, okay, well, it is what it is. Um, but then that morning of waking up and not smelling and hearing my mom cook in the morning and not seeing my dad sitting in his chair with coffee, reading the Bible, ready to have conversation and not seeing my siblings and nieces like sporadically come out of rooms as they woke up. I just realized how significant who I am and where I come from is. Um, so I don't know if you've had that same experience, but oddly enough, I didn't put it together until I was like piecing this together, but that same Christmas when my parents came out, the gift that I gave everyone in my family was a DNA test. Um, I don't know if anybody has done this. Have you traced your family tree, whether it's like surviving relatives or ancestry.com, anybody done those? Well, they've sold hundreds of millions, so statistically more of you have done it. So... <laughs> Um, so you have probably, you just don't want people to know, uh, but it's okay. They're going to use that info one day, but it's all right. Um, <laughs> and I just thought, I don't, uh, it seemed gimmicky at the time and I did it anyway. And I was like, what am, what am I hoping to find really? And you know what? Ancestry.com is doing it right. They're doing it right because they said Jared and I were brothers. So they, I mean, they nailed it. They knocked it out of the park on that one. It was worth the 60 bucks to find out it was real. It was real. So, um, but I think what we're really all hoping to find, honestly, come on, is that we're related to somebody really important and specifically somebody that's rich that has got an inheritance for us that we didn't know about, right? That's what we really want. <laughs> that, that's what I wanted. Um, uh, we weren't. So I'm still teaching. Um, why do we care where we come from or who or what is in our family tree? And part of it is it, it helps us understand and tell our story better. And it roots us in history. And our teaching text today um, is a genealogy, uh, the family tree, the family tree of Jesus. Uh, I'm not sure many people are jumping at the chance to like, teach through a bunch of names that you can't pronounce. Um, so actually, we've asked Hannah 
to come and read them, so I didn't have to. No, just she's going to do great. So Hannah, would you come? In Matthew chapter 1, if you'd like to follow along, um, in verses 1 through 17. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez, and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram, and Ram the father of Amminadab, and Amminadab the father of Nashon, and Nashon the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David the king. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah, and Solomon the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam the father of Abijah, and Abijah the father of Asaph, and Asaph the father of Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat the father of Joram, and Joram the father of Uzziah, and Uzziah the father of Jotham, and Jotham the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz the father of Hezekiah. And Hezekiah the father of Manasseh, and Manasseh the father of Amos, and Amos the father of Josiah. And Josiah the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. And after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel, and Shealtiel the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel the father of Abiud, and Abiud the father of Eliakim, and Eliakim the father of Azor, and Azor the father of Zadok, and Zadok the father of Akim, and Akim the father of Eliud, and Eliud the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar the father of Matan, and Matan the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations, and from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations. Nicely done. Thank you, Hannah. If you were unaware of what was happening on this tree, every name on these ornaments is a member of Jesus' family tree. Um, because our family origins matter. This is even true in like fictional stories. So if you think of big epic stories like Lord of the Rings or Harry Potter or Star Wars, um, all those stories, their lineage matters. Who their parents and their uncles were mattered. Where they came from mattered. And like the thing about Luke Skywalker's lineage that his dad's Darth Vader is like a cool little plot twist, right? But in the end, it's just a story. It's once upon a time in a galaxy far, far away. I mean, that's how that one goes. Um, But what Matthew is doing in chapter one, how he starts this out is he grounds who Jesus Christ is and what he does in history. So in other words, what he's saying to us is all this happened. This is all true. It's not a story. It's not once upon a time. And in the ancient world, genealogies would be like probably what our resumes are today, right? Our greatest hits. Here's where I went to school. Here's what I've done. My skills. You don't, you leave off the stuff you don't want people to know about. Um, And David really like comes out swinging because here's how he starts. Jesus, the Messiah, the son of Abraham, the son of David, the son of Abraham, right? I mean, Two of the greatest men in Israel's history, right? Flawed, but but great. I would start with my greatest relatives too. I would want people to know, (laughs) yeah, I'm related to these people. Um, But, but Matthew's reasoning for starting this way isn't what you're thinking. It's not a, I'm the rightful king because of who's in my lineage. It actually points to something else. Matthew's starting with these two men, I think, 
points to this. God's promises made to and through his people and fulfilled for all people. See, the Christmas story is the gospel story. And as most of us know, gospel means good news. It's an announcement, an announcement of what God has done. So you should ask the question, what has he done? What promises has he fulfilled? Well, a lot, but mentioning like Abraham and David, I think he points to two specific ones. The promise to bless all people and the promise to establish a new and never-ending kingdom. So in, uh, in Genesis chapter 12, this is the promise God makes to Abraham. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And I imagine, I don't know, that Abraham maybe thought like, all right, I mean, God's been, been on it to this point. So I'll, I believe it. Maybe the people that I'm going to like come in contact with in my lifetime, I don't know, God's going to bless them somehow through me. I'm, I'm on board. Little did he know that God was talking about a much larger blessing to a much larger people. See, Abraham points to this moment that God selected and separated his family and promised the to bless the entire world through them. So Jesus in this line, one of them, um, is saying that he's part of them and he is who the worldwide blessing is going to come through. It's through his coming that this blessing comes upon all of us. So what's the blessing in the coming? Well, it starts like anything. It's a declaration of good news. So here's the good news. The Christmas story is good news for people with problems. Thank goodness. <laughs> it's good news for people with problems, not good advice for people with problems. There's a difference. There is. If you want advice, I don't know, go to read Tony Robbins. Uh, but advice is... It's counsel about what you must do. And news is a report of what's already been done. Advice is counsel about, uh, is about making something happen. And news urges you to recognize that something has happened and then respond to that. So if like we were a village in a kingdom and we got word that there's an army coming the king would send an advisor and say, hey, here's the battle plan, sharpen your swords, right? We'd, we'd have advice that we should follow to, to defend ourselves and save ourselves. But if the king routes and defeats the army, he's not going to send an advisor. He sends a messenger that says, stop what you're doing. You don't need to save yourself. I took care of it. That's good news. You can stop. And so the birth of Jesus is a gospel announcement. It's a good news announcement that you're in trouble, but God came to help. That it's worse than you thought, and you're worse than you thought, but God is better than you thought. It's good news that you can't save yourself, but God has come to save you. And if this is true, if all of these things are true, then everything else the Bible says about how to live makes sense. The gospel is a news report of what happened thousands of years ago in history. But if we just approach it as like a moral story looking for advice on how to live, we're going to miss the big picture. And here's the big picture. And the big point is Jesus really came to earth. He really was the son of God. And he really did make a way for every human to be saved. And that's why Matthew starts the Christmas story with the family tree of Jesus. Because it's true. It's not a fairy tale. It's rooted in history. Because it's good news, not good advice. You don't have to try to save yourself anymore. It wasn't going to work anyway. Because it shows that God has kept his promises to bless all people. See, that promise that he made to Abraham thousands of years ago, he is fulfilling it in Jesus Christ. So another part of this blessing is that Jesus comes to establish 
a new kingdom that won't pass away. And so when he mentions son of David, here's the promise that he makes to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom forever. And if you read the story of Israel, you know it wasn't David's son that he was talking about. He was talking about God's son. See, David points to Jesus. David isn't the savior of Israel. Jesus is the savior of Israel and all other people. David points to Jesus as the royal successor and the rightful heir to that throne. And Jesus' kingdom is already set in motion when he comes as a baby. And it's a kingdom where death isn't the end and where evil doesn't triumph and where everyone can be included. So not only is the gospel story good news for people with problems, it's not just good news for some people, it's good news for all people. Not just a selected few, not just the people that got it together, not the people doing it right. It's good news for all people. See, Jesus came in the middle of chaos. And if we're honest, that's kind of what the last few years, and maybe every year has felt like, like a dumpster fire of chaos. <laughs> but Jesus is familiar with that. He's familiar with loss and disappointment, gender division, racial tension, political power struggles. He was born in the middle of all of those things. He didn't have to come in 2021 to experience that. He knew that thousands of years ago. It was happening then, too. It's not new for us. But see, he came and he stepped into the mess, not around the mess. And here's how we know that. If you look at all the rest of these names on this tree, this is how we know that he stepped into the mess. See, when we, we look at them, at these names that Hannah read so well, we don't think much about it. We think, all right, Abraham, David, got it. Those are the people we know. The rest of them are probably listed because they're all right. They're not all right, actually. The, one of the beauties about Scripture is it doesn't gloss over anyone's behavior. <laughs> it's real accurate. And um, it's kind of like our own family trees. We got some wonky branches in our family trees too, right? We don't want to talk about those people. We're not sure what to do with those people. Jesus had it too, but he just like listed them. It was kind of like, yeah, we got it. Here it is. Here's our, here's our mess. See, in this tree, there are the names of five women. I know some of you are thinking like, good. And some of you are thinking, well, that's not enough. There needs to be more. <laughs> um, but the thing is like at that time, women just weren't thought of as important as men. And you wouldn't put women in your resume, so to speak. That wouldn't give you any credence. So why would you do this? I mean, they were gender outsiders. Gender tensions were nothing new. And yet Jesus lists all of them. And most of those women were Gentiles, meaning that they were not in the chosen people of God. They were a different race. Racial tensions are nothing new. They were racial outsiders. And yet they're in the tree being used by God to bring Jesus into the world who brings with him blessing and a new kingdom. Kids went out, right? You know who else is in here? Three of them are surrounded by sex scandals. Rahab, most people kind of know, I think if you're familiar with scripture, was a prostitute. She's listed. Perez and Zerah are mentioned as the children of Judah and Tamar. They were children of incest. Right? And then we get to King David, and I don't know if you caught how he mentions King David, but here's the line. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. See, Matthew makes sure everyone knows that David had a child with someone else's wife. And although David was important in their history, he wasn't perfect. He was messed up too. Jesus' family is not this like picturesque, hallmark, special 
It's like a Netflix original that's rated TVMA. <laughs> it's full of prostitution, incest, adultery. I mean, you wouldn't let your kids watch that stuff, right? I mean, I don't think, right? So it's a mess. It is a mess. And so what does that mean for you and for me and for the world? Well, I think it means what the song says. A thrill of hope. The weary world rejoices for yonder breaks a new and a glorious morn. People excluded by gender, race, culture, or even the law of God, sinners like us excluded, all those people can be brought into the family of God because of Jesus. And that's good news. That's great news. The good news of Christmas is that you and I can sit down as equals at the table of God because of the grace of God. This part of the good news, though, often gets derailed by our self-righteousness. We have this innate desire in us to be right. I've had a lot of fights over this with, in relationships about being right. <laughs> And honestly, I think that God has put that in us, like, but we have misread it. We read it wrong. God has ingrained in us the knowledge that we aren't right and that we need and want to be right. I think that is from God, but we too often cut him short. We cut him off. Oh, we need to be right? Okay, I'm going to make myself right then. But we should have let him finish the sentence, which was, I've made a way, the only way actually, for you to be right. It's not from you. I'm, I got it. I took care of it. And what self-righteousness requires, though, is that we have to look down on someone else, someone else to feel better about ourself. And maybe you look down on people like those snobs that have so much education because they think they're better than everyone else and smarter. Or maybe you're the opposite. Maybe you're the one with the education. You look down on the people that don't have it or didn't go to the right school, don't have the right job, don't make enough money. Or maybe you look down on those people whose political views are ruining our country. But we all look down on somebody. This culture of self-righteousness tells us that everyone else has the problem or is the problem, but we're fine. Everyone has this picture of what it means to be right and acceptable. But the truth is, that we're like Isaiah said, a people living in a land of deep darkness. We know something's wrong and we don't know how to make it right. And we know that people are wrong and our efforts to make them right aren't working. And we'll only come to real freedom and true rest when we lay down our self-righteousness and surrender fully to God. See, the world values money and prestige and race and class. And what Jesus says is that doesn't matter in my family. I want everyone. Here's how Paul sums up the good news of blessing and a new kingdom for all in Romans chapter 3. Everyone has sinned. No one measures up to the glory of God. The free gift of God's grace makes us right with him. We're declared free of guilt. We made acceptable and granted eternal life. Christ Jesus paid the price to set us free. God gave Christ as a sacrifice to pay for sins through the spilling of his blood. So God forgives the sins of those who have faith. God did all this to prove that he does what's right. He keeps his promises. He's a God of mercy. And it was to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. So who can brag? No one. No one can brag. Are people saved by the law that requires faith to obey? Not at all. They are saved because of the law that requires faith. You might be intimidated 
or ashamed to approach God in the season, to approach his word, or even to approach his family, the church. And I just want to say he's not intimidated to approach you in this season, and he's definitely not ashamed of you. And he wants to give you a brand new gift. A new life is waiting to be born in the middle of your mess. Not after you clean it up, not after you get the broom and the dustpan out, in the middle of your mess. And it's, it's only through surrendering your life to Jesus. We're going to come to the communion table in a few minutes to receive again this good news of Jesus. And as you come, I want you to remember the good news that for those who surrender to God, God keeps his promises to bless all people and give them a new life in a new kingdom and graft them into his family tree. See, we've been tied into this tree, grafted into Christ. We're born again into the family of God. So the family that you were born into doesn't define you. The family you're born again into, God's family, defines you. The power of the cross and the power of the promises fulfilled by Christ is more powerful than your family history or your family tree. How you've defined yourself because of your regrets and your mistakes and your mess is no longer true. Because the power of the cross redefines everything, even family. Because of Christ and his ability and his willingness to change our lives, we are now defined by his family. And so we do family the way the family of God does it. And we do conflict the way the family of God does it. And we do community the way the family of God does it, because his family is more powerful than your family of origin. So come with your family to the table or your friends that are like your family and remember and praise God that we're now part of his family because of this good news. And if you haven't got it yet, hear this. The good news is for you. And that through your brokenness, not because you don't have any, because you do, but through your brokenness, Jesus is going to use you to bring his life into the world around you. So hear this announcement as you come. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. God keeps his promises, family. You can stop trying to save yourself because God has come to save you. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, Ryan. Worship team, would you join me up here? Man. That is good news. It's really good news. That the, the hope today is that uh, we don't have to bank on our dysfunction, our history, but we've been invited into a bigger family. That's the good news today. Thank you, Ryan. And as we prepare our hearts this morning, I, I just want to invite you to stand with me. And um, the table's been set and I just want to invite you in just a moment to respond by coming to the table and declaring that, that Jesus has brought us this morning into his family. That is by his broken body and his blood poured out that we are heirs to the kingdom. And we're also going to worship together as well. But we want to um, respond also by taking an ornament, and uh, we have two tables on either side. And uh, we want to take an ornament, and each family, we want to invite you to write your name down 
on an ornament. And if you want to flip it over and your kids can write their names in the back, but each ornament is going to represent a family. And um, as we participate in communion and worship, we also want to grab an ornament and place it on a tree to my right and my left as a, as a symbol that we've been grafted in to the family of God. It's not exclusive and it doesn't end in the book of Matthew, but it continues through history. And we're part of that. And if, you're, uh, if your children are with Radiant Kids this morning, we're going to open those doors. And we also have tables outside. So you can actually uh, just go and, and uh, grab your kids, uh, go outside, make an ornament, and then come back in and as a family, place it on our tree. Would you do that this morning as, as we worship together? Come to the table and then as a family, um, take a bold step of declaring the good news this morning. Thanks for listening. We want to be a resource for you as you walk with Jesus. So please connect with us at radiantvicelia.com. Until next time. There is a heavenly city that I'm compelled to find. Oh, I love the flowers and trees and the smell of the grinding sea. And all the beautiful things here in life. And I